An improvised explosive device, short ID, is not something new in warfare, yet only following the war in Afghanistan in 2001 and especially the Iraqi insurgency in 2003, it became a regular element in news reporting. IEDs accounted for a large amount of losses among military personnel in Iraq, and sometimes even complete armored vehicles were destroyed. Considering the technological capabilities and advanced equipment of the US and coalition forces, why were these comparatively low-tech IEDs such a threat for armored vehicles? Well, most vehicles used in Iraq in 2003 were still vehicles from the Cold War, or at least mainly built for thematic large-scale warfare, which is quite predictable in comparison to asymmetric warfare. Thus, for every weapon system of the enemy, there is usually an active or passive counter in technology and or doctrine. Additionally, the development of major weapon systems can take years or decades. As a result, the basic parameters of enemy weapons are usually known. This is in stark contrast to IEDs. IEDs are particularly insidious in that they are, as the name implies, improvised. And this means that it is often difficult to predict the mass of explosive, the type of explosive used, and the nature of fragmentation it will produce. The same author notes that Cold War tanks and some armored personnel carriers were designed to withstand the typical blast man with around 9 kg of TNT, which was around 95% of all mines. But we will also need to account how these weapons were used. Regular military forces use mines usually as an area denial weapon, which means the enemy should be prevented from entering an area and or be funneled into a specific approach. This requires laying many mines in large areas. In contrast, in asymmetric warfare, an armored vehicle is a high value target since it carries a large amount of people. Additionally, it follows a usually predictable route and is thus easier to ambush. As a result, comparatively only a few IDs are used as specific points for ambushes, thus very different from the usual use of mines of regular armies. Thus, due to the overall mission and past experience of US and coalition forces, they were not properly equipped nor trained against IED attacks. In contrast, some countries had developed various mine resistance vehicles around in the 1970s. For instance, South Africa and Rhodesia, due to various ambush attacks on vehicles with mines during the Rhodesian Bush War. Note that the area of Rhodesia is about the area of modern Zimbabwe. But since US forces for the most part weren't fighting such wars, there was no need for such vehicles or changes in the overall vehicle construction? Well, this is the overall answer to the why question, but let's look at the more technical aspect of the why. Namely, what effect an attack with high explosives has on vehicles? When a mine or IED explodes under a vehicle, there are basically four effects. The vehicle is lifted, the floor is deformed, the floor is perforated, and or the vehicle suffers a loss of structural integrity. So let's take a closer look at these effects. If the blast wave is strong enough, the vehicle can be lifted off the ground. This might not sound so dangerous at first, but you need to consider that this will happen suddenly. Thus the vehicle, passengers and interior equipment will endure an abrupt isolation. Not to mention that the original movement of the vehicle needs to be accounted for too. During the Rhodesian Bush War, mine resistance vehicles had to drive slower than 29 km per hour. Whereas the risk of injury would increase substantially. Sudden acceleration and rapid deacelerations are quite uncomfortable even in a car. Something you probably experienced. Yet armored vehicles are usually rather tight, full of hard surfaces and edges. Additionally often loaded with various equipment. This means that anyone that isn't strapped in or equipment that isn't properly secured can result in major injuries, even if the hull is not damaged. The next major threat is the deformation of the floor plate. This means that anyone who is in direct contact with the floor will likely suffer injuries like fractures. But still besides loose equipment or parts, the number of fragments will be limited. Something that changes once the floor plate is perforated. In this case, all kinds of fragments from the mine, armor and debris will likely enter the vehicle. This is probably the most likely form of injury sustained from IED attacks in recent years. If a small study from the British in Iraq 2006 is representative which notes that 100% of the 53 casualties suffered open wounds, 52.8% fractures, thus only a small amount sustained blast injuries and burns. And of course, the worst is the loss of structural integrity of the vehicle. The explosive load is powerful enough to bend the steel structure beyond its strain to failure limits. The water lines fail and parts of the structure are propelled radially outward. Which is a fancy way of saying that the vehicle will be all over the place. Now let's talk about countering the effects of ID attacks in terms of vehicle design. There are many different ways to do it. Some seem obvious like angling the floor plates. 
that some measures will also create new problems. For instance, increasing the distance between floor plate and ground would limit the impact of the blast. But this would also increase the height of the vehicle and thus decrease its overall stability. Similarly, in the pattern of the W-shaped hull it is noted. For example, increasing the thickness of the hull or raising the hull height can improve a vehicle's performance when an explosion occurs. However, these design changes, increasing thickness and raising height, create other problems. They reduce a the vehicle's mobility and payload and reduce the available stroke for mitigating the black shock which affects occupant survivability. So the question is, what are useful designs? Well, one of the most obvious ways is to use shaped floor plates. This means instead of a flat bottom hull, the hull is V-shaped or it is at least partially angled, as you can see here. Now the V-shape means a certain increase in height and thus loss in handling and stability. An alternative is to use a double V or a double U-shape. With this construction some parts of the blast are directed away from the vehicle, whereas other parts are directed into the center of the vehicle, which initially sounds like a bad idea, but according to the patent and the explanation by Hazel, the energy is distributed along the center and a controlled deformation happens, which creates a downward pull due to the upward pull of the other areas of the shaped floor plate. Note that I'm not entirely sure if I understood that correctly. Hence, if you want to be sure, please check the patent, especially figure number 7. Another possible way to deal with an upward blast is a blast chimney, which would be located in the center of the vehicle and allow the blast energy to pass through the vehicle. Now both the W hull and the blast chimney reduce the effect of a blast by redirecting energy in a controlled way. Now in some cases this is not possible, but because something can't be controlled doesn't mean that there's complete absence of control. What does this mean? Well, the introduction of elements that are allowed to break in order to prevent energy traps that could reduce crew survivability. One way to do this is by using breakable wheel axles. This allows large tires to break off and thus energy will move away from the vehicle. Another important part to protect the passengers directly is to use suspended seats and footrests. Thus the passengers are not in direct contact with the floor plates, which are often suspected to severe isolation loads. Additionally, harness to restrain the occupants of the vehicle and equipment. Now besides improved and angled armor, spalling shields are also recommended to prevent against spalling, which is parts of armor breaking off due to the stresses that are caused by explosion and perforation of the armor. And finally, reinforced welds to increase the structural integrity, since welds are often the weak elements in armor. As a final note, some existing vehicles were upgraded, like the Striker, which in several variants used the double V hull, enhanced armor and new suspension and improved seats, although some variants kept the flat bottom design. So to finish this off, a short summary. Why IEDs are dangerous to many armored vehicles? Well, during the Cold War, most regular armies were focused on fighting a symmetric war, where mines were used in large quantities and relatively small explosive loads. Whereas insurgents mostly use few IEDs with large explosive loads for ambushes on specific points. As a result, modern armor design and doctrine was usually not adapted to counter IED attacks, which often used large amounts of explosives. Thus the resulting blast energy couldn't be properly absorbed by flat-bottomed armored vehicles. Now in order to counter such IED attacks, concepts and designs were developed or reused from forces that had experience with such attacks, in order to redirect large parts of the blast effect away from the passengers and thus increase crew survivability. As always, sources are linked in the description, in this case most of them are freely available. If you want to learn more about tank armor, check out this video, or maybe you are more into why the Germans built an aircraft carrier in the first place. Anyway, thank you for watching and see you next time.